Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased indeed to be here and have this opportunity to talk to you on human rights. And what I'm specifically going to focus on is towards a hierarchy of human norms internationally, and of course with specific reference to the experience of European integration. Earlier on today, we heard um, one of the people who made a contribution saying that politics can be a force for good. And of course, I would totally agree with that. And I am coming to this, obviously, from the perspective of someone who is an elected politician, uh, which may be that it, I, I put forward a point of view which maybe won't be different, but perhaps a slightly different emphasis from the, what we've heard from the two very distinguished judges who came before. But I think where we start from, and has been mentioned already, is the concept of the nation state, which has so much been the way that Europe has organized itself for many hundreds of years. And I think we are moving away slowly but definitely from that to a much more international structure. And we've heard already how human rights law is becoming more internationalized and is no longer necessarily done at nation state level. I think too, the European Union itself is obviously a huge and new, still very new experiment in regional integration. And when I talk about regional, I'm going to be talking about regions of the world as opposed to regions of nation states. And I think this really presents us with huge opportunities and huge challenges, and nowhere more so than in the specific issue of human rights, human rights law, and how it is evolving within the experience of integration and specifically European integration. Overlapping systems of norms obviously are becoming more commonplace and do exist and are causing issues and fragmentation, which can lead to divergence with the result that human rights are not necessarily applied in the same way in different countries. And my proposition is, in the course of what I'm going to be saying to you, that in order to render human rights effective, we must go beyond the traditional state international organization and instead use the fact that we are now seeing regional integration as a way to filter what can sometimes be quite abstract notions and apply them practically in various regions of the world. And this can, of course, be done in a variety of ways, but I'd like to focus particularly on the application of international and supranational norms by supranational courts, as evidence, of course, by European integration, which is what I'm focusing on in the course of this short talk. International law, as we've heard, has a heavily entrenched system of human rights protection. And we've had a very good explanation just now of how that works. And there are, of course, a panoply of multilateral treaties, not least the UN Charter, which have created a whole series of obligations on signatory states. And enforcement is naturally a common problem, as is the watering down of provisions or acceptance of reservations in order to ensure maximum participation of state parties. This means, in effect, that countries are subject to a whole array of obligations which are not always standardised, and the same rights are not always interpreted coherently by human rights bodies and courts. And it's not possible, really, I think, for any one institution to bring about this sort of coherence. And sadly, not even the European Justice, Court of Justice, I think, is able to do this, or, and, and, and not really able to be a forum to resolve interstate disputes. And so without, inevitably, one single human rights court providing a definitive ruling, the only option is to make use of existing systems of regional courts. And that's where the experience of European integration comes into this. 
So the crux of my argument is that the only actors capable, really, of rendering international norms effective are established supranational courts. And this is so because of subsidiarity, something that we hear quite a lot of throughout the European Union. Subsidiarity because such courts exist at an inter intermediate layer between the national and the international, and therefore both can take inspiration from international norms while rendering them applicable and consistent in the states under jurisdiction. I'm not saying that this is an ideal solution, far from it, as different levels of integration and the balance between countries may result in divergent interpretation. It is, however, I believe, the most effective choice that we have now at this moment. And I would like to talk about the specifics of regional integration law, something which the human rights community must get to grips with, I think, if it is to ensure compliance across countries. And increasingly, the process of regional integration is confronted with fundamental rights. As its goals of economic integration begin to be realized, the economic integration perhaps came first, and now we're moving on to these more substantive and, and in some ways much more difficult issues. In the EU, for example, we have had years of case law defining citizens, workers, spouses, family members, moving away from the initial view of an individual as a homo economicus to something far more substantial. In an ideal world, we will find a balance between international norms and the institutional arrangements agreed by member states. By this, I mean the coexistence of international law and regional, regional integration of law. But in terms of human rights, our prevailing notions of the relationship between the state and the international community are, I believe, anachronistic and inadequate to cope with the way that things are evolving now, and that they fail to take into account the increasing number of layers separating the system from the law governing him or her. The raison d'etre of human rights is their universality, as we have already heard. And we should worry if that application of these rights begins to fall short. I want to now speak more specifically about the regional integration experience of Europe. I use the term Europe not simply to refer to the European Union, but the human rights integration which has gone under the aegis also of the Council of Europe. Europe is, of course, subject to a series of regional integration measures. And so the application of human rights norms must be enacted not simply by a national court, but by supranational courts too, which can lead to a confusion of jurisprudence on the subject of human rights. This problem is particularly acute in the member states of the European Union, which are all parties to the European Convention, and so now have to take into account the jurisprudence of two final courts of appeal. The Convention on Human Rights is still the most extensive safeguard of European rights and is still the only human rights agreement providing the individual with a wide-ranging recourse against his or her own state. <coughs> Procedurally, the complainant must exhaust all domestic remedies before application is made to the court in Strasbourg, but the wide-ranging protection afforded to the complainant under the Convention still means a complainant's rights have a good chance of being upheld. Since the entry into force recently, fairly recently, of the Treaty of Lisbon, three essential changes have taken place in terms of human rights law, all contained within Article 6. First, the Charter of Fundamental Rights has been made legally binding, with the same status as the treaties themselves. Secondly, the EU is required to accede to the European Convention with the caveat that this cannot extend the EU's competencies. And finally, that the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the ECHR and the constitutional traditions common to the member states constitute general principles of EU law, and that is codified into a treaty provision. The ECJ has pushed a human rights agenda 
over a series of cases since the 1960s, but has generally rooted these in obligations inside its own legal order and not in relation to external treaty obligations. Uh, the ECHR is, of course, a notable exception to this. The ECJ, so as not to undermine its own system, has, under pressure from a series of judgments from constitutional courts in Germany and Italy, undertaken and agreed a messy compromise by which the EU has accepted itself bound by constitutional traditions of the member states and the Convention on Human Rights, in spite of not being a party to the ECHR, and therefore not bound by the court's decisions. So this has created a rather strange situation regarding the EU and member states. But perhaps more importantly, while the Charter of Fundamental Rights contains less extensive and slightly different rights, access <coughs> to the court is much easier. While the, the criteria for direct action by an individual to the Court of Justice still remains restrictive, a national court may send a preliminary ruling to the Court of Justice, an option which becomes a requirement when it is considered by the highest court in the land. This allows the Court of Justice to render a final definitive decision on a question of interpretation of European law, which is then applicable in member states. On the other hand, the nature of the Charter is, as stated in Article 52, that it applies only where the member states implement EU law. This evidently leaves a glaring omission in that European fundamental rights seemingly lose all relevance where a situation is deemed purely internal, even though the Court of Justice has begun to slowly chip away at that concept, as indeed we're finding quite interestingly in the UK at the moment. I would like to end by saying that while we maintain that what, what has gone on I, and the importance of what I've just said, I want to leave you with one essential question, and that is, is it possible to respect both international human rights norms and the specificity of regional integration mechanisms? It seems doubtful, given what I've already said, but given the need for these regional entities to ensure the effectiveness of their own laws and with increasing multipolarity in international and regional legal systems, many more actors with divergent views will need to be consulted on their interpretation of human rights, risking even more fragmentation. And as I pointed out at the beginning, fragmentation is a real issue. However, how I has also pointed out, can we really render international norms effective without recourse to the supranational institution? At least in the short term, it seems that the answer is no. In the longer term, international organizations would need to try to make regional systems converge on the subject of human rights so that these rights can be equally enjoyed, as was the original intention. Without this commitment, I fear that human rights would yet remain too abstract and too remote from the very people that they try to protect. <laughs>